Opening up the green belt and opening up a controversy. The province's plan for the protected lands now at the center of a potential investigation by the RCMP. Good evening. Ontario's Provincial Police Service says the move is to avoid any perceived conflict of interest. It is the newest chapter in a scandal brought to the forefront in a scathing report and just hours after the resignation of a political staffer. CTV's Queen's Park Bureau Chief Siobhan Morris is live with our top story tonight. Siobhan. Well, Michelle, for many months, Ontario Provincial Police have been digging around, conducting interviews, looking at potential evidence to see if there's enough material here to warrant a full-blown criminal investigation. This would be their anti-rackets branch that would have looked in on this. Then, two weeks ago, the Auditor General shared that scathing report. She said that she had talked with the OPP based on some of the things that she found. Now we know that the OPP has passed on their files to the RCMP and they are at the beginning of looking at whether they believe an investigation is warranted. The RCMP is exploring whether to launch an investigation of whether someone committed a crime in the Greenbelt land swap. The OPP's anti-rackets branch had been weighing this but passed the decision on to the Mounties. Well, absolutely. If they ask the RCMP to investigate it, they believe there's something that requires further investigation. Provincial police wanted to avoid the appearance of conflict of interest, looking into the government that oversees the police service's work. Many members of the public, probably half or more, would say, oh yeah, they're just looking after government. So to get rid of that entirely, be transparent, they gave it over to the RCMP. The opposition leader welcomes a fresh set of eyes. Countless reports have shown there's more than enough here to warrant an investigation. She points to findings of the Auditor General that developers had an outsized influence on which Greenbelt lands could be built on, drawing plans themselves. Provided those in a, in a brown envelope to a, a political staffer at a dinner. The possibility of a criminal investigation comes the day after the political staffer at the heart of the Auditor General's report resigned. The government had backed Ryan Amato, chief of staff to the Minister of Housing. Either they know that their polling numbers are taking a monster hit and they're desperately thrashing about. And asked Amato to leave to save face. Or they know that something else is coming down the pike. The interim liberal leader finds the timing interesting. Things are heating up. It's getting much more serious. Mr. Amato made some very, very poor choices. Uh, but I do think he's a scapegoat. None of the opposition parties are content with the level of accountability from the government. For the, the minister, it means resignation. For the premier, it means saying, you know what, I'm going to accept the Auditor General's recommendation to revisit these Greenbelt land schemes. The premier's office says it's working on all the other recommendations related to process flagged by the auditor. Still to come is an investigation by the Integrity Commissioner. He's looking at when he, whether any ethics rules were broken. The expectation is that that report could drop sometime this fall. Reporting live from Queen's Park, I'm Siobhan Morris. Nathan, back to you. All right, thank you, Siobhan. And our extensive coverage of this story continues online. Be sure to visit ctvnewstoronto.ca and download the CTV News app as new details emerge. Turning next to a tragic scene in Peel Region, a fatal hit-and-run crash in Mississauga. The victim, a person riding a bike, and the province's police watchdog is now leading the investigation. CTV's Allison Hurst is live near Airport Road and Thamesgate Drive with more. Allison. Police are still trying to confirm the identity of the victim and her age, saying that all they know is that she was riding a purple mountain bike. A bike lies on the side of the road next to pieces of a vehicle and trails of evidence markers. The aftermath of what police say was a deadly hit and run. It was like it was happening just on the other side of the wall, because that's how clear it was. Dominic Cicerelli was in his back sunroom just after 3 a.m. when he heard a scream, a loud thud, and a vehicle taking off. <laughs> like a scared scream, like, like something hit something. You know when a car guns it, when you put the, the foot on the gas and the wheels spin, and you think that's what it sounds like. The car taking off quickly. Peel police say officers found the cyclist lying on the grass with severe injuries. She was pronounced dead on scene at Airport Road near Thamesgate Drive.
she remains unidentified at this time, uh, but the only information we can give out is that she was associated to a, uh, a purple mountain bike. When we don't know the age, uh, we can speculate that it's likely an adult, that she's likely an adult, but we can't confirm. The Special Investigations Unit has taken over the investigation. According to its statement, police came across the vehicle around 3 in the morning before the vehicle was struck and spoke with the driver. As police verified their information, SIU reports the vehicle took off. That vehicle's been recovered. It's a 2018 uh, Mazda 3 four-door, blue in color. And it's being processed for evidence uh, right now. According to SIU, it was found a short distance away around 4 a.m. The, the driver is outstanding. Um, Based on some of the evidence that's been uh, you know, obtained at the scene, um, we are confident we know who the suspect is, but we're waiting to confirm that at this time. The SIU is engaged whenever an officer has an interaction with a civilian that results in death, injuries, or sexual assault. And again, police are trying to confirm the identity of the victim. So they're asking anyone who knows someone who was perhaps supposed to show up at work who didn't or was supposed to go home or go somewhere else who rides a purple motorbike, mountain bike, excuse me, to contact them. Reporting live, I'm Allison Hurst. Michelle, back to you. Thank you, Allison. Durham police are now identifying the suspect arrested in a stabbing in Oshawa that left a man with critical injuries. It happened in the area of Dalhousie Crescent and Niagara Drive Tuesday morning. Witnesses say the 66-year-old victim was walking his granddaughter in a stroller when he was attacked. He remains in hospital. Police said a suspect who was known to them was arrested without incident. Today, they named him as 20-year-old Noah Denyer of Oshawa. He's charged with aggravated assault and assault with a weapon. Investigators have issued a warning to the public after a string of carjackings in Markham over the last week. This video is from last Thursday night near Renus Avenue and Beaver Bray Drive. York Regional Police say a black BMW SUV rear-ended a vehicle at a stop sign. Then a suspect got out with a knife and took the victim's car. The holdup unit believes the same two suspects were involved in separate incidents Sunday and early this morning, also involving the same black SUV. They're advising drivers to be aware of their surroundings. York police are also sharing video of a traffic stop after the young driver they pulled over decided against asking for a ride home. You're going very fast, 124 kilometers an hour in the city. It's more than double the speed limit. So you're stunned driving tonight to go speed. Who owns the car? Uh, my parents. This happened earlier this month near Elgin Mills and Highway 48. When police impounded the vehicle, the driver said he'd take the three hour walk home instead of asking his parents to pick him up. He later took an Uber. Police say following the speed limit would have been the best option. The OPP says a possible tragedy was narrowly avoided today on the 400. At around two in the morning, a tow truck operator spotted a vehicle blocking a live lane of traffic near Finch. He thought the woman behind the wheel might be impaired and called police. Toronto OPP responded, located a 28-year-old female from Brampton in that vehicle, along with a two-year-old child in a car seat that was in no condition to be used as a car seat. Uh, the driver was taken into custody for suspected impaired driving. Police say the suspect's blood alcohol level was double the legal limit. They also say she was a G1 license holder. She's facing charges, including impaired driving and abandoning child. A live look outside on this wet and rather chilly Wednesday. Not too much in the way of sun today, and you might have grabbed a sweater or a light jacket. Fortunately, the grass and the foliage will get much more of this unsettled stuff to come. Lindsay Morrison is here with a look at the current conditions. It could get stormy overnight. It could, Michelle, and I'm glad you found a silver lining. This wet weather is good for lawns and gardens, but other than that, it's been a, a bit of a gray, dreary, chilly day. Yeah, we struggled to climb out of the teens today here in Toronto. In fact, we didn't. We spent all afternoon at around uh, 17, 18 degrees. Here's where the heavy rain is right now and where it's been the majority of the day across southwestern Ontario. There are uh, rainfall warnings in place along with a special weather statement that may have just come to an end. As for the winds, they're coming out of the southeast right now. Pretty light, but temperature wise, we're cool. Only 18 degrees and we're not going to drop all that much overnight tonight. We will talk about the potential for stormy weather coming up. For now, Nathan, over to you. All right, thank you, Lindsay. Some breaking news from the world of sports. The Maple Leafs have re-signed star forward Austin Matthews to a four-year contract extension. The average annual value of the contract is $13.25 million. Matthews has a year remaining on his current deal. 
The 25 year old racked up 85 points with 40 goals in the regular season last year and added 11 points in 11 playoff games. Following the announcement, Matthews tweeted, I feel fortunate to continue this journey as a Maple Leaf in front of the best fans in hockey. I will do everything I can to help get us to the top of the mountain. Still no end in sight to a strike involving workers at numerous GTA Metro stores. And tonight, an escalation in the job action. CTV's Janice Goulding is live with more. Janice. Hi, Michelle. They started gathering here at the distribution warehouse at the West Mall in Dundas at 6 a.m., blocking trucks that deliver meat, produce, and other products to grocery stores across the province. An intensification of a strike that began 26 days ago. Transport trucks weren't getting into or leaving Metro's Etobicoke warehouse this lunch hour. One day stronger! Workers forming secondary picket lines at two Metro distribution warehouses. No trucks in, no trucks out, so there's no produce, no nothing going to their stores right now. More than 3,700 frontline workers have been on strike at 27 GTA Metro grocery stores since July 29th. And this expanded secondary picketing impacts all Metro and Food Basic stores provincially, not just the GTA. The company statement reads, they are currently preventing all deliveries to our stores, which is unacceptable. The distribution centers and the impacted stores are not on strike and their operations, which are critical, should not be interfered with. But employees say they're here to send a message to their employer. Enough is enough. We're sick and tired of worrying about how we pay our rent and our bills and how we get our groceries. We're here to send the clear message to Metro that we're sick of you making the profits off our backs. It's time for you to share those profits with us. Unifor says workers want their fair share of profits. Their quarterly financials were announced. Profits were up another 26% in the middle of this strike. And they're still saying they can't afford to pay our members a decent pay or give them decent hours of work. Sorry, it doesn't cut it. We work hard every day. We deserve a better pay. And many are asking that their pandemic hero pay, which amounted to $2 an hour, be reinstated. That's what this is about. It's about money. It's about that pandemic pay that was taken away from them. It was us who came to work every day. It was us who... who who, who tried to support everybody throughout the pandemic and now we feel like we can't afford to live. We feel like we can't afford to shop at our own stores. It's not right. The company didn't respond to these demands in their statement today, but did say rather than picketing sites that are not on strike, the union should come back to the bargaining table, which Metro has been requesting since August the 12th. No more crumbs, justice instead. But the union says the picketing isn't going to end anytime soon, and it wants the company to get back to the bargaining table with a serious, fair offer. Unifor says in addition to its regular pickets outside grocery stores, it will be holding these secondary pickets outside these distribution warehouses in Toronto around the clock. Reporting live from Janice Golding, now back to Nathan. Thank you, Janice. Residents of a West End apartment building are still without power tonight after a five alarm fire Sunday. It happened at 357 Rush Home Road near Bloor and Dover Court. Toronto Fire has deemed the building safe to occupy and units have water again. A spokesperson for the management company says they don't know when electricity will be restored, but they hope to have more details tomorrow. The Ontario Fire Marshal's office is still investigating what caused the fire. A coalition of community groups is backing a rent strike that has seen some Weston neighborhood tenants withhold payments since the start of the summer. The group's urging the landlord to negotiate with the tenants unit, union as the protest nears its fourth month. CTV's Natalie Johnson reports. I could walk from here. Charlene Henry has lived in this Weston apartment building for nearly two decades. 19 years. And says she's fed up with the conditions. Constant elevator in service that we cannot use. She calls the construction constant. No plastic down. And says the support for the tenants' rent strike continues to grow. When I say rent, you say strike. Rent, strike. Rent. Today, a coalition of more than 50 food banks, faith groups, and community organizations announced their backing of the rent strike at two buildings in the Weston neighborhood. This shows that the community is behind the rent strike, that there is a lot of support, and that we're not alone, that it's a, it's a fight for everyone. We didn't think that there was going to be that much support because we didn't think that many, very many people cared around here. 
And it turns out that really people really do. The rent strike at 33 King Street began June 1st, with tenants decrying rent hikes and construction. 22 John Street joined in July, calling for rent control. Our land our name is Dream, but we know they're a nightmare. Dream tells CTV News that it has always been open to accommodating tenants facing hardship, but that we are concerned that the tenants are getting bad advice as they are responsible to pay rent and will need to pay rent to stay in the buildings. Dream also says the above guideline rent increases were inherited from the previous owner and that it has not applied for any of those hikes since it acquired the properties in 2021. Tenant power! But the tenants insist the backing of so many neighborhood groups indicates growing solidarity. Hopefully across the city other um, buildings will follow suit and know that they have the power to do rent strikes and fight for housing justice. The dynamic is changing because people are listening, right? As they prepare to take their strike into September. Natalie Johnson, CTV News. The federal Liberals wrapped up their cabinet retreat in Charlottetown today with a pledge to millennials. The Prime Minister says he owes younger Canadians action on the high cost of living. The pledge comes as the largest voting bloc is turning its back on the party in droves. CTV's Kevin Gallagher reports. In front of his revamped cabinet, the Prime Minister acknowledged the younger voters who helped propel his Liberals to a majority eight years ago are struggling under his government. We owe it to you to take action so you can fully benefit from the promise of Canada, so you can succeed and access all the opportunities that generations before you had. Justin Trudeau described the disruption of COVID restrictions, out-of-reach housing prices, and the high cost of living as challenges facing young Canadians that his cabinet is committed to solve. These events upended your educations, your first jobs, your early years of building a career and a network. This Liberal appeal to younger voters might also be a reflection of changing public opinion, as recent polls show millennials are increasingly turning towards Pierre Polyev's Conservative Party for solutions. I'm basically proposing to do the exact opposite of everything he's done on this file. He doubled housing costs. When I was housing minister, housing cost half as much. How are we going to do it? We're going to balance the budget to bring down inflation and interest rates on mortgages. People born between 1980 and 1996 are now the largest demographic group in Canada and a major reason why both the Liberals and Conservatives are battling for a narrative that appeals to them. They need to uh, recognize that there's an underlying disease, of a broken generational system that's giving rise to a range of symptoms that are harming younger people. Climate change, housing unaffordability, government deficits. With Parliament set to resume in mid-September, the Conservatives are calling on the Prime Minister to bring it back earlier to deal with these affordability issues the government is promising to address. Kevin Gallagher, CTV News, Ottawa. In B.C., heavy rain overnight helped douse wildfires that have forced the evacuation of more than 25,000 people. Our immediate priority continues to be getting people uh, home as soon as it is safe to do so. Uh, and I'm happy to report to you today that we will be downgrading some properties in Kelowna, West Kelowna and Lake Country, um, allowing more residents back into their homes. Those returning are being told to be cautious and stay out of forested areas. Smoke conditions and visibility have improved significantly in the Okanagan Valley. More than 170 properties have been damaged or destroyed by fires around Lake Okanagan in the southern interior. A state of emergency remains for the province where there are more than 375 active wildfires. Thousands of evacuated residents of Yellowknife are anxious to return home, but the mayor says not yet. NWT Fire still deems the, the fire to be uh, a threat to Yellowknife, so it's not safe to return. What I can say, though, is that, you know, staff are already working on the plans for, for reopening so that um, when it's safe to do so, we can, we can get people back as quick as possible. That plan is focusing on verifying fire safety and ensuring essential services are up and running. A wildfire still about 15 kilometers from the capital. Crews are evaluating how much work it'll take to eliminate the threat. Blazes are also close to Fort Smith and Hay River. Meanwhile, the King issued a statement today on the wildfires in the Northwest Territories and British Columbia. 
It reads in part, my wife and I send our deepest condolences to all those who have lost loved ones and we continue to pray for all those who have been displaced, who have lost their homes, businesses or property in such dire circumstances. Our admiration is unbounded for the tireless work of local officials, volunteers and first responders in assisting and protecting their neighbors and communities in the face of such danger and uncertainty. The BC Wildfire Service has shared a video of what it calls an incredibly rare fire tornado. The giant pillar of fire was shot by firefighters last week as they battled the downtown Lake Wildfire near Lillikin. It was created by a combination of extreme fire intensity, plunging humidity, and very low dew point. Complex terrain and downslope winds also contributed. Officials say such unique conditions are not usually seen in British Columbia. One of the firefighters battling the blaze in West Kelowna became a Canadian citizen this week, and he attended the ceremony over Zoom in the back of a parked fire vehicle. Walter Roos is from the Netherlands, but has been in Canada for 18 years. He wanted to become a citizen for a long time because of the close ties he feels to his community. Scorching temperatures fueled wildfires across Europe today. In Greece, firefighters battled the blaze for a second day close to Athens. It forced additional evacuations. And authorities warned that heat and wind could spark more wildfires. 20 people have died in the country, where 355 blazes have broke out since Friday. There have been more than 200 in the last 48 hours alone. In Turkey, efforts are continuing to contain a wildfire burning in a region that neighbors Greece. The fire in a northwestern province has already burned 1,500 hectares of land and has caused nine villages to be evacuated. More than 50 people suffered smoke inhalation. Elsewhere, France, Spain and Italy are grappling with searing heat waves. Russia's civil aviation agency says the leader of the Wagner mercenary group was among 10 people killed in a plane crash today. Yevgeny Prigozhin's forces fought some of the fiercest battles in Ukraine over the last 18 months. But he also led a brief armed rebellion against the Russian military earlier this year. The private plane went down almost 300 kilometers north of Moscow. There were no survivors. In Ukraine, a Russian attack has killed at least four people in a northeastern city. A school was hit in, the Sumi, in Sumi where the principal, his deputy, a secretary and a librarian died. Four other people were injured in the drone strike. Ukraine's emergency service shared video showing rescuers clearing debris at the site. Canada is sanctioning more Russians accused of supporting the invasion of Ukraine. The latest penalties focus on banks, defense companies and the nuclear sector. Four Russians and 29 entities are named. They include a shipbuilder and subsidiaries of the State Atomic Energy Corporation. Ottawa wants Moscow to uphold international nuclear safety standards. One of Donald Trump's co-defendants in the Georgia election case surrendered to authorities today. Rudy Giuliani left a jail in Fulton County after being booked. He has denied wrongdoing and defended the former U.S. president today. Six other co-defendants have already surrendered after being charged with trying to reverse the 2020 election. Trump is set to turn himself in tomorrow. India became the first country to land a spacecraft near the moon's south pole today. This success belongs to all of humanity. A lander with a rover inside touched down on the lunar surface just after 6 p.m. local time. Scientists believe the historic voyage could reveal vital reserves of frozen water. India joins the U.S., the Soviet Union and China as only the fourth country to land on the moon. And back here at home, Rogers customers now have access to 5G wireless service on parts of the subway. But it's unclear when that will expand to Bell and TELUS subscribers. The cell service is available in stations and tunnels on the lower U of Line 1, which covers St. George, South to Union, and North to Bloor Young. On Line 2, service is available in stations between Keel and Castle Frank, plus Spadina and DuPont. Rogers says it has also improved 911 service for all riders. The telecom giant has been in dispute with its competitors since it bought the company that held the exclusive contract to provide TTC cell service. My role is to speak on behalf of Canadians and express the frustration uh, that I sense in Canadians and my own frustration to the fact that 
after the 30 days deadline I gave them to agree on something, they have not. And therefore, we said, okay, uh, we're going to take appropriate measures to make sure that as soon as possible, because there's some network infrastructure that needs to be built, but, but uh, as soon as we can, uh, that there will be coverage in the Toronto Transit system. It's important to say that, you know, I think the Rogers is only offering it at a few select stations. It's not the entire system. Um, and I do want to have those conversations with TELUS and Bell because I, I am sure they want to provide this service to their customers as well. But the infrastructure is actually owned by Rogers, mm -hmm. which I think is part of the, the tricky part. And, you know, as someone who takes um, TTC and who has that frustration of, oh, I wish I could just check my internet or my email or read the newspaper while I'm there, I get it. It's been a long wait, especially when you compare us to other cities. Uh, but we are moving forward. I think it's a need, yeah, for safety reasons, things like that. I think it feels safer to have cell service on the subway. Do so you feel better today having it? Yeah, I do. Well, it helps a lot when you need to communicate, especially if you're waiting for like a ride on the subway or anything, or if something important happens. Uh, will you ever do work on the subway, or is this more for your sense of uh, peace of mind? It depends. If I have a meeting or something comes up, if the subway's delayed, obviously I can pick up my computer and do that. I was in the call and I told my mom my phone's gonna get disconnected, I'm in Subway, and I was surprised it didn't. Bell, the parent company of CTV News, released this statement. Rogers clearly continues to seek to advantage itself at the expense of Toronto residents and is showing brazen disregard for the ongoing consultation led by Minister Champagne. That consultation proposes conditions of license that would compel Rogers to provide access to all wireless carriers so that all TTC riders can have reliable connectivity on the subway. A statement from TELUS says on behalf of our customers and hundreds of thousands of TTC riders, TELUS is outraged that Rogers has restricted access to internet connectivity on the TTC. The TTC is a public service paid for by the people of Toronto and everyone should have equal access to connectivity and the added safety it provides. Rogers has demonstrated a complete lack of cooperation on access for all riders, refusing to meet with other carriers or grant roaming access. For its part, Rogers says Bell and TELUS have been playing games instead of negotiating on behalf of their customers after showing no real interest for over 10 years in providing wireless services or raising public safety concerns about the limited coverage in the TTC. We continue to respectfully participate in the federal government's consultation process. Coming up, the rain didn't stop them. Hundreds lined up to be the first to explore the all-new IKEA in town. Just ahead, we'll take you inside where a smaller format is bringing the shopping experience to Scarborough. And I'm Pat Foran. Coming up on Consumer Alert, there is a new twist on the grandparent scam. Criminals are now calling, pretending to be your friend in trouble, and they're using artificial intelligence to sound exactly like them. A Vaughn man just lost $8,000. I'll have my report just ahead. While we've had wet weather today, it's worth mentioning that so far our August rainfall is trending below average, lower than last August and lower than normal. There's been significantly less rain than there was in June and July. Meanwhile, it's been humid, but not necessarily hot this month. While we came close on the 12th, we are yet to hit 30 degrees here in Toronto. Will that change in the final week of August? Your seven day forecast is coming up and stay with us. We've got another full night of great shows for you right here on CTV. We've done many stories on the grandparent scam where criminals call seniors and pretend to be grandchildren in trouble who need bail money. Now, some scammers are calling pretending to be your friend and they may actually sound like them to make the scam even more believable. Here's Pat Foran and Consumer Alert. Pat. Nathan and Michelle, a Vaughn man got a call from someone claiming to be his good friend. He said he was in jail and needed money. The man gave him $8,000, but later found out his friend's voice had been cloned using artificial intelligence. I honestly believe so, because I tell you, um, it sounded just like him. A man from Vaughn will call Sam asked us not to identify him. He recently got a call from someone claiming to be a close friend in trouble. Sam was convinced it was his friend because he sounded just like him. But I tell you, Pat, it sounded identical to him and his mannerisms too were identical. And that's what sort of trapped me into this whole ordeal. The friend said he had been arrested and needed money for a lawyer. 
He said that it would cost about $8,000 uh, cash to bail him out. Sam later found out his friend was fine and that criminals had cloned his pal's voice. Sam was scammed out of $8,000. Voice cloning is real. They can take a snippet of your voice and reproduce it in a manner that is virtually indistinguishable from you. To clone your voice, scammers only need a few seconds of your speech. They could record you in person, steal it from your social media accounts, or even take it from your smartphone's answering machine. I stand before you. Eleven Labs, a company that specializes in voice replication, showed how easy it is to make Leonardo DiCaprio sound like Joe Rogan. One of the four hundred thousand people. Steve Jobs. And the billions of others around the world. And Robert Downey Jr. As an actor. I pretend for a living. In the U.S., where the impersonator scam cost Americans $2.6 billion last year, officials are trying to get the word out to beware of any call where someone is demanding money, even if it's someone you know. It's hard because the technology is real and it's good. But a red flag that everyone should be on the lookout for is the request for money. If you get a call from someone claiming to be a friend or family member in an emergency, reach out to them directly. As for Sam, when the thieves called him back to extort more money, he said he knew it was a scam. That's when the man's voice changed. It paused and then he went to his normal voice. It was no longer the AI assisted. And it's not just friends and family. Businesses have to be careful. Someone doesn't call pretending to be the boss needing money to avoid being scammed. You could have a special code word. But again, if you have any doubts, hang up and call the person directly. On your side, I'm Pat Foran. If you have a consumer story idea, email us at alert at ctv.ca. All right, to the forecast, we had some rain, there was clouds, but at least it wasn't a washout, depending, I guess, on where you were. Definitely. You know, the summer days, they're fleeting. So I think even if it is raining, people are still going ahead with plans. They're doing things. They're on the water. They're enjoying this. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling a few people will be doing the same this weekend. There is a little bit of a question mark when it comes to one day this weekend and whether or not we're going to get uh, any wet or stormy weather. But I agree. I think most people want to proceed with their plans. Second half of the weekend is looking fantastic. Let's talk about what's going to happen leading up to it as well. Weather is brought to you by Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. It's hard to stop a train. Now, one area where it was a bit of a washout today was between Sarnia and London. Radar indicates that uh, some areas have picked up 50 to 75 millimeters of rain. There's been some localized flooding as a result. Earlier in the day, this was impacting the Windsor area. Rainfall warnings remain in place. A few scattered showers impacting portions of the West GTA, but it hasn't been quite as bad for us as it's been to the Southwest. How much more rain? This is additional rainfall at this point. Uh, Windsor, again, heads up in your neck of the woods. An additional 50 millimeters of rain could be possible through tomorrow. And I'm going to move to this side just so you can see where all of the active weather is for the most part. This is waking up tomorrow morning. Again, it is predominantly across southwestern Ontario. But into tomorrow night, some more organized rain or maybe thunderstorms could roll in. Once again, it's looking like West GTA through the Niagara Peninsula that's going to see the worst of it. However, we will have a, a chance of showers here in Toronto, generally unsafe settled through tomorrow and then through the day on Friday. We're going to get some clearing and by Friday evening we should be seeing the sun again. So that will be nice. Let's talk about this heat dome that's happening stateside. Of course, it's very hot, but along this jet stream, this has been our storm track and it's why we're getting one low after another filtering its way into southern Ontario. Temperatures once again today in central parts of the U.S. in the upper 30s, in some cases uh, 40 degrees. Not the case for us. As mentioned at the top of the newscast, we didn't even climb out of the teens today here in in Toronto. It's 18 degrees right now. It is 25 in Windsor, so a little bit warmer in that part of the province. Not expecting the temperature to drop uh, in some cases at all through the night tonight. And then tomorrow daytime high 23, but look at the Humidex. 31 in Windsor and London. It's going to feel like 40 tomorrow. Here's the seven day forecast. So Friday we'll see a little more in the way of sun. Risk of storms or at least a little bit of wet weather into Saturday could be dry. It looks like it might be cloudy. Lots of sunshine for Sunday and Monday. The weekend is also going to be below seasonal daytime highs in the low 20s. That's your look at the weather for now. Nathan, over to you. All right. Thank you, Lindsay. Also tonight, Scooter Braun in the spotlight. 
As a slew of stars part ways with a powerful celebrity manager, many are wondering why the mass exodus. Research underway around the world, including here in Toronto, is focusing on Crohn's disease, specifically trying to predict who may be diagnosed with the illness. And as CTV's health reporter Pauline Chan explains, a new piece of that puzzle has been discovered. This is where the actual uh, samples are processed and uh, prepared either for shipping to be analyzed elsewhere uh, or some of the analysis is done here. Dr. Ken Kroturu's lab at Mount Sinai is investigating possible triggers for Crohn's disease in an effort to find ways to prevent the disease from developing. And they're focusing on the genetic links between family members that have the illness and those who are still healthy, like Doug Bricknell. He's seen how his mom suffers with Crohn's. I saw the way she was able to persevere through everything that she's faced and continue to, to be the wonderful person that she is. Uh, but it was also sad to sort of see her held back from the things that she loves, not being able to participate in uh, volunteering activities, sports. His grandmother and a cousin on his mom's side also have Crohn's disease, so Doug and his sister have been participating in the GEM project. The Genetic, Environmental and Microbial Project began 15 years ago, sponsored by Crohn's and Colitis Canada, and so far it's gathered data on 5,000 people from around the world. Participants submit blood, urine, and stool samples to track who might develop Crohn's disease, and the researchers recently discovered a biomarker. This is the first time we've been able to show that there is changes in the gut bacteria that are present before disease occurs that actually helps predict those who are at increased risk of developing disease. The biomarker is not a particular microbe, but rather a collection of gut flora. The interesting thing for the Bricknells is that Doug does not have the biomarker, but his sister does, so researchers can compare the two in the coming years. Pauline Chan, CTV News. Reports out of Hollywood suggest tensions between the writers and major studios are only getting worse. The two sides have been holding talks in recent weeks, although there weren't signs of much progress. In a letter viewed by Deadline, the Writers Guild of America accuses studio leadership of lecturing its negotiators and refusing to budge on his only counteroffer in the talks. The studio says their last offer addressed the WGA's top concerns. The strike began May 2nd, shutting down most TV and film production in the U.S. Justin Bieber is reportedly joining the list of artists cutting ties with music executive Scooter Braun. A source tells People magazine the Canadian singer is working on music without Braun for the first time in 16 years, although Braun remains Bieber's manager. Representatives didn't comment as reports say Ariana Grande and Demi Lovato are trying to distance themselves as well. And Taylor Swift fans got to hear a new recording of her song, Look What You Made Me Do Today. It appeared as part of a trailer for Amazon's streaming series, Wilderness. Swift has been recreating her older hits after ownership of the originals was transferred to Scooter Braun. The next full album to be released will be 1989 Taylor's version in October. Toronto's cultural calendar for the next month is filling up as the city announces the 2023 edition of Nuit Blanche. The 17th annual event will take place from 7 p.m. Saturday, September 23rd until the following morning. More than 80 installations from close to 250 artists will once again fill city streets across downtown Toronto, Etobicoke and Scarborough. As always, entry for the public will be free and you can check out renderings of some of the art on offer and plan your Nuit Blanche on the city's website. Stars Tonight is brought to you by Lastman's Bad Boy. Who's better? Nobody. After the break, produce, like everything, is expensive these days, but these fancy fruits take the cake. Find out how much a box of six luxury pears fetched at auction in Japan. Good evening. On the next CP24 Breakfast, actor and singer Billy Porter has conquered stage and screen, and now he's embarking on a brand new project created by queer people for queer people. And he'll be here to talk about it all. That's up on the next CP24 Breakfast, up first at 5.30 a.m. If they ask the RCMP to investigate it, they believe there's something that requires further investigation. 
Updating our top stories, the RCMP is probing the Ford government's handling of the Greenbelt after the file was referred to them by the OPP. A formal investigation has yet to be launched. The move comes after an Auditor General's report earlier this month, which found the province gave certain developers preferential treatment in connection to the Greenbelt. The driver is outstanding. Um... Based on some of the evidence that's been uh, you know, obtained at the scene, um, we are confident we know who the suspect is. The SIU says a driver who struck and killed a cyclist in Malton early this morning had fled a traffic stop less than an hour earlier. Police say the female cyclist was struck and killed near Airport Road and Thamesgate Drive north of Derry sometime between 3 and 4 a.m. The vehicle was later found abandoned a short time later. If there is one group of workers who deserve respect, decent pay, and decent work, it is grocery store workers. Metro is filing an unfair labor practice complaint against Unifor amid its ongoing worker strike. It comes after pickets were set up at two distribution warehouses, which Metro says is preventing the delivery of products to stores across the province. Remember to keep up to date day and night through our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca, and by downloading the CTV News app. And if you have a news tip, photos, or video of breaking news, let us know. The future of transit in Scarborough is once again in the spotlight in the aftermath of that recent derailment involving the RT. Many people in the area feeling neglected and ignored when it comes to their commuting options. CTV's John Musselman is live with more. John. Well, absolutely right, Nathan, and they're expressing that frustration tonight. I'll just step out of the way and show you. There's about 100 people that have gathered here. We're at the Ellesmere Scarborough RT station parking lot. Now, you remember last month, there's a derailment of the Scarborough RT train, which led to the closure of the line. And what these people are saying is it's an inadequate response from the TTC to just put shuttle buses. They say they need much more than shuttle buses, uh, pointing out that if this were to happen on a subway line in downtown, it wouldn't just be permanent shuttle buses. They want a dedicated bus lane here because they say it's affecting people's families, it's affecting the way to get to work. Uh, it's affecting all the time it takes to get to sometimes in some cases three buses just to get to a subway station. A local city councillor is here, an MPP is here. They're all uh, having a speech about this and we'll have much more on this story tonight on CTV News at 11.30. Reporting live, I'll send it back to you. All right. Thank you, John. On the markets, the Canadian dollar is up about a tenth of a cent to 73.89 U.S. American benchmark oil losing 75 cents, closing at 78.89 U.S. a barrel. And the TSX Composite Index gaining 188 points, ending the day at 19,879.79. Everyone knows food prices are way up. So imagine dropping more than $1,500 on six pairs. That is what a fruit store paid at auction in Japan. These premium grade pears were cultivated for 16 years and now the winning bidder plans to turn them into desserts. Just imagine what those tasty treats will cost. Just ahead, Indigo set to open a first of its kind concept store in Toronto, offering customers booze with their books. A peek at the all new elevated experience in moments. If you're a regular at your local mall, there's nothing quite like a, the opening of a new store. And that was the case in Scarborough today, a retailer known for his huge location, doing things a little different. Here's CTV's Mike Walker. Oh my God. Hundreds lined up in the rain hours before the doors open. Instead of traveling 20 minutes to North York, Akia, we can just travel 10 minutes instead. It's going to be super convenient. Hi. Some lining up as early as 6 a.m. The line of eager shoppers wrapping around Scarborough Town Centre and throughout the mall inside. I never expected this, especially for Scarborough Town Centre. It's great that we finally have one because the other locations have been more uh, central or like to the west. Yes, <laughs> Kia's newest location opening to much fanfare in the space once occupied by Sears. We have been here with a smaller plan and order point that we had earlier, and we knew just by the reception that we got in the community that we had to go bigger. So we think Scarborough's a wonderful place for us to expand and be more accessible. Shoppers navigating the familiar maze of displays in the 7,400 square meter store. Light, you know, bad, you know. 
For shoppers, the excitement is all about convenience, especially those who rely on transit. And it's close to home and it's not so far, just one train and we're already here. And looking to stretch every dollar. I'm currently trying to furnish my uh, unit that I'm staying for a few months. Um, and I don't really want to particularly pay for like thousands of dollars to like dress my unit. The store creating more than 150 retail jobs and is expected to attract an additional million visitors to Scarborough Town Center in its first year. And that boosts business for everyone in this mall and importantly it keeps Scarborough working. This is a smaller concept store without the familiar warehouse. Instead larger furniture items are only on display and orders will be shipped. I personally would like to have the warehouse to have like the full IKEA experience. I don't mind waiting a couple of days, I don't think that's a big problem. The second of its kind in Toronto drawing approximately 7,000 visitors on opening day. Mike Walker, CTV News. And if you're a fan of books and boozy beverages, you'll be able to soon experience both at a first of its kind store downtown. Indigo Books and Music says the 16,000 square foot location will include a gourmet coffee truck offering pastries, snacks, beer and wine. We have more details on this Indigo concept store on our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca. And you know what both those stories tell us? Businesses after years of pandemic are investing in our city. It's so true. It's so true. And you know, who doesn't want to go to a bookstore on a rainy evening like this. It's not quite a heavy downpour for us here in Toronto, but a different story elsewhere. Here's a look at the satellite and radar. Rain continues to impact areas, especially between Sarnia and London. There's a look at the weather watches and warnings that are in place. A few thunderstorms out there. Tomorrow's high 23 degrees, and that's one more look at the seven day forecast, Nathan and Michelle. Thank you, Lindsay. Well, that's it for us, but be sure to join Anne-Marie Medawake tonight at 11 for CTV National News, followed by Zoraida Allman with our next local newscast at 1130. In the meantime, our coverage continues anytime on CP24 and online at ctvnewstoronto.ca. For Lindsay Morrison and all of us here at CTV News, thank you for watching and have a great night.